So hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Elodie portales casabar I'm the Clinical Research Informatics Lead at BC Children's Hospital Research Institute. And I'm the co-lead for this BC AHSN REDCap support that we, serve, uh, we provide through the BC support unit um, in collaboration with uh, Victor Espinoza from Island Health. And so today's webinar is to um, um, to tell you a little bit more about what REDCap is, in case you don't know what it is, um, but mostly to highlight two of our users and their projects uh, and, uh, and what they, why they decided to use REDCap to, for their research studies and, and what they like or don't like about it. Um, so we will go, I will do an introduction on REDCap and the two projects, and, and then if you can keep your questions until the end, I will be happy to answer any question you have. So uh, starting with uh, an introduction, first who we are. So our um, services, um, specifically the BCHS and REDCap are provided through a partnership um, with, uh, between so the BC Children's Hospital, um, Island Health, the Center for Clinical Epidemiology and Evaluation, C2E2, and Population Data BC, where the data resides. Um, and so all of this service is provided through um, uh, BC Support Unit funding and under the umbrella of BCHSN. Um, so REDCap means Research Electronic Data Capture. It's a web-based um, data collection platform to create and manage databases and online surveys. So it is a, sorry, it's a secure and a, a standardized data management tool um, that's really meant for um, collecting um, privacy sensitive data and managing it and storing it in, in, a, in a, a secure way. Uh, the tool was created originally in the States at Vanderbilt University and uh, they've created and actually I, I don't think those numbers are up to date here but they uh, created a consortium and once uh, you join the consortium you have access to the software and can implement it locally and uh, and uh, support your users. And so you can see here that it's really been um, installed and um, um, implemented worldwide in lots of many uh, institutions. It's a, it's a really a great community. So why um, would someone want to use REDCap? Well, first it's uh, very easily accessible. Um, it's web-based, um, you can do direct data entry. It's, Sorry um, to disturb you, Elodie, but yes, uh, yes. I'm not sure if we can see your screen. Um, is everybody able to see Elodie's screen? Can somebody confirm or is it just us? Where, where are you at? I, I can see it. Oh, okay, perfect. You guys can see the, sorry about that. Okay, perfect. Are you all on the slides where you use red cap? Yes, that's what I see. Okay, perfect. Okay, let us know if there's any, any trouble. Um, so it's a collaborative and centralized environment so that uh, if your study is multi-site, it's easy for users from all of the different sites to uh, log in the system and, and uh, enter the data they are responsible for. It's uh, highly customizable um, with a fast and flexible way to design your forms uh, and implement them and change them when needed. Um, it's really, it's really um, user friendly uh, to, to make changes at any time. Uh, it maintains a consistent and accur accurate data entry um, with um, detailed changes uh, stored. And so you have an audit of every action um, that happened in your project. And then you can export your data into any uh, common statistical packages or any, any format you might need for analysis like SPSS or R. Um, it's secure. So as I said, the data is um, located at pop data um, in the population data BC uh, environment. Um, you cannot um, access it without user authentication and there's two factor authentication uh, implemented on top, meaning that uh, when you want to log in, you have an, a code sent to you by SMS and you have to enter this code. So you have two um, authentication um, parameters before you can log in the system. Um, and uh, I guess one of the best benefits for uh, all BCHSN members is that the support through the BC support unit is free and it includes training uh, and support and all of the needed data storage. And again, it's uh, maintained by population data um, in information technology team um, who perform all of the upgrades uh, and uh, documentation and backups. Uh, so who is eligible to um, uh, get access to the service and how do you request access? 
so the because the support uh, unit is really um, meant to support patient-oriented research, those are our main customers. Um, and, um, and so if you have a patient-oriented research project that is approved by a research ethics board, um, access to the service is free of charge. Um, but we do also provide uh, support to non-patient-oriented research who, who, requi who require such a tool but um, don't have access to it through their own institution. Uh, there's only a $500 fee for these projects. And so what, how do we define patient-oriented research? It's research done in partnership with patients. Um, and that answer research questions that matter to patients uh, aiming to improve healthcare. So this is a very high level definition and I, I know there's much more to it, um, but the support unit is always happy to, uh, to help determine if research is patient oriented or not. Uh, our basic support package that you got uh, that you get through uh, our support is uh, that we will create the project for you uh, based on, on what your study is about. Um, we'll authorize uh, the specific users uh, as per investigator specifications to access the project. You'd have up to four hours of in-person or remote training. Um, and, uh, and again, we provide a secure environment for your study data and all of the updates and upgrades uh, along the way. Um, and, um, and yeah, so this comes like, then you're, you're the, the owner of your project and you're the one designing the instruments and everything that you want to collect in there. Um, we have a um, request form uh, that you can just, so don't, don't um, worry about noting down all of those links. Uh, you'll be able to uh, see them uh, through the slides once they're circulated later or um, look at this recording again. Or even better, if you just Google um, BC Support Unit Redcap, you'll just uh, find the our Redcap page and the link to the request form is there as well. So we have the documentation, we have um, uh, standard operating procedures and all of this is accessible there. Uh, once your project is approved, um, we'll send you a service agreement uh, that you can sign electronically and you'll need to have a population data BC account, which is very easy to request. Um, and, um, and basically we will provide you access to your project through that uh, account. Uh, and so this is where REDCap is accessible, but you won't be able to access this ent until you have um, your project uh, granted and, and the population data um, BC account. And then we'll support you along the way for any training or question you might have as you design and uh, start your project. So how do you design your project? So there's three phases really in a project. The first uh, is development, when you're gonna create your forms or instruments and do the testing and make sure that it fits all of your needs. Then you're gonna push this project to production. And once, in, once it's in production, you can collect live data, um, track and monitor data entry and make sure it's all done right. Uh, you can still make changes there in what we call the draft mode and, and implement them. So once you're in production, you can still uh, customize a bit your, your, uh, your forms. And then once you're done collecting data, you enter the analysis phase. And, and analysis, it's not typically done in REDCap. You export your data, build reports, and there's quite a sophisticated way to, to build reports in REDCap. And you can ensure that your data quality is good with, uh, with some uh, man data management tools available in REDCap. Um, so what, when you set up your project, you'll have access to this project setup page. And it's really like a checklist of all of the things you need to think about uh, while designing your project. And you can see that um, REDCap is very uh, customizable and, uh, and flexible. So there's lots of different options. So sometimes there's just too many options. It's hard to pick which one will fit your project. And that's why we always recommend that you have an initial uh, meeting with our support team to just make sure that the way you're going to design your project is the optimal way in REDCap because there's oftentimes several ways of doing the same thing. Um, but REDCap is really, it's, it's a click and point kind of interface and you can just go through the steps and, uh, and we have a documentation for, uh, to help you along the way. There's really no programming skills need, needed. Uh, and so the way you design your instrument, there's two different ways, but one is through their online uh, designer. And it's again, you click button to add a field, you define what type of field it is, 
um, whether there's a specific validation on this on this field, whether it's required or not. So there's quite a lot of things you can do um, to specify your field. And you have all of the typical types of fields like dates, drop downs, check boxes, Likert scales, images, uh, just descriptive fields. Like there's a, the whole list of a, of a field type of field you, you can use. Um, and another way you can also um, import your data dictionary through Excel. So if, if your um, uh, form is very long and complicated, sometimes it's just easier to design it outside of the interface and then just upload it also. Both, both options are possible. Then once your form are done and you're, you've, pushed, you've pushed your project, project to production, um, you can start data collection. And there's really two different ways of doing data collection in REDCap. One is uh, data entry. So it would be uh, anyone from the research team that logs in using their specific uh, credentials and enter data in the form. And so that's what a form might look like. And every, every change, every addition, anything done to the data would be logged so that you would know exactly which user entered which data at what time. Uh, the other way is through a survey. So you can send a login. And so here, the, this is actually the data entry form and the survey of the same form. So you could, you could use both on one. The, the way you would design your form is not going to be different, whether it's a data entry form or survey. And, um, and then as a participant to a survey, so again, you enter data and then you submit it at the end. Um, and you'll have a timestamp of, of when the survey was submitted. Uh, and so you, for that, you do not require login because people don't have access to any data. They just fill out the survey, push the data in REDCap, and that's it. Um, and it can be anonymous where you send the same link to a, to a group of people and, um, and that's what they use. So you don't know who uh, fills out the survey or you can f send individual links to specific people so that when the survey is filled, you know um, who, who it, uh, it's coming from. And so once you're done with data collection comes the reports and exports phase. Uh, and so you can, you can build custom reports where you select which column you want to see, filter your data based on any of the fields, um, and you have lots of ifs and thens conditions. Like you, you can be quite sophisticated in the, in the way you build your reports. And so you can just view your report in REDCap or then export the data into various formats, as I said before. And there are for your fields that are flagged as identifiers, and there's different ways to protect uh, um, sensitive data in REDCap. Um, then you can flag those so that they will never be available for export in the end. So that was it on my introduction to REDCap. There's way more to REDCap and um, there's uh, lots of tutorials, videos, and documentation that is available. This is really just meant to give you an overview of what it can do. Um, but we're happy to meet with anyone who would have um, additional questions and want to talk about a specific project and, and see whether REDCap would be the right tool for it. Um, just let us know. Uh, for now, it's, it's now, now time to go to our REDCap project highlights. And I'm really, really thankful for uh, uh, two of our users to agree to, uh, to talk about their project and their use of REDCap. Uh, we feel that it's, it's always best for um, researchers to use to, or, or um, uh, research uh, team members to um, hear from their peers uh, of use cases and what they think about the tool. It's always the best way to know whether um, that's uh, something they should um, think about or not. So the, the first uh, user who's going to talk about her project is uh, Maurice Omar, who is a project manager and clinical research coordinator at the Fraser Orthopedic Institute. And so I will now uh, continue on to her slides. Hi. Um, yeah, okay, I'll just mute myself now. Okay, hi, thanks uh, for the introduction. So this uh, project is a first time for us. It's the Info patellar versus suprapatellar reamed intramedullary nail, nailing for fractures of the tibia, short form insert. So next slide. So I'm the research manager coordinator. Um, oh, we'll go back. Should be just my introduction. Sorry, the first slide is project introduction. Isn't that what you see? Oh. 
No, it should be just my, it should say my introduction. Oh, sorry, yes. There we, yeah, there we go. Oh, okay, so again, that's okay. So I'm the research manager coordinator. I've been in uh, research in orthopedics for 24 years, same department, um, although it's uh, obviously grown from just a single, just me for um, two days a week to a staff of four now. So three uh, research assistants who run the clinical office and do all the recruitment and the follow-up. We have a vast experience in uh, collaborating in multi-center clinical trials, but we've always been a sub-site. We've never been a, a lead site in a study, except for back in 1997, which was obviously a long time ago when things were a lot different. But as I said, we've always been a sub-site. Uh, we've worked on 60 plus national and international studies over this uh, 24 years. I have a very limited experience in project manager. Again, just the one study back in 97. And, oh, my screen went black. And it's always been paper CRFs. And um, back then, it was, there were no EDC systems available. Next slide. So the idea dates back to the spring of uh, 2015 for this actual study. Um, the, my two lead surgeons, PIs, are both brand new. This is their very first time being principal of investigators in an investigator-initiated study. So we were all kind of um, learning as we went along. Fortunately, I was very, uh, very lucky to be able to contribute to all aspects of the study from the, from the groundwork up to uh, today when I... Um, do all the uh, data verification and the everyday running of the, the trial. So from protocol writing, literature reviews, the very basic stats, drafting of the CRFs, choosing my patient uh, reported outcomes, uh, the budget, all grant applications and funding opportunities, everyday finance of the study, uh, site communication, and just the everyday runnings of the study. So they've given me a lot of leeway, which has been really actually very nice. And they also gave me extreme latitude in the development of the management for the study, including my choice of the data management systems, which I'll talk about in a bit. Next. So this is a clinical study. It's an international multicenter randomized study. We're comparing two approaches for methods of, for fixation of the tibial shaft. And it's either entering up the canal above the kneecap or below the kneecap. We, our sample size is 202 participants. We have six sites, five from Canada and one from Spain. Um, we were the first site, and our first participant was recruited in uh, September 2016. So over a year from concept to the first recruitment, which is probably actually a little bit faster than normal. But uh, So we were lucky in that regard. Our target sample size was actually reached just last week. But now looking at the data, we realized that um, although we had accounted for a 21st 20% loss to follow-up, um, we actually lost more than that. So we're going to have to over-recruit, uh, but having everything in red cap, we were able to watch this as we went along. So uh, we are aware that we have to over-recruit, and we'll be letting the sites know this week. So next slide. So we have a limited experience with other systems. We've worked on iDataFax, Empower, iMed, iMedNet, and Data Labs. But being the manager, uh, data entry is not part of my everyday task, and that's usually left with the research assistants. So um, the reason that we went into the red cap is also a number of our current projects were, were moving from paper to electronics systems, and many of the other sites that we collaborate with were, were choosing red cap. These sites were branching out to red cap as it was becoming more common, and institutions were approving its use and we didn't have to go through all the privacy issues with uh, ethics approval. So if we all used the same EDC system for our projects, it just made things a lot easier. We work with a lot of the same sites over and over again, so um, it's, it just makes it a lot easier. New and upcoming uh, projects were also going to be using REDCap, so again, it was another uh, obvious choice to use. It's relatively cheap, um, if not free. We're one of the sites that um, we were approved, even though we're not a patient-oriented study, we were approved for use and help with the system. So that was good. So it's, it wasn't free, but it certainly is not expensive. 
The other reason we chose it, it's available and it's housed in Canada now, which it wasn't at the beginning, but it is now. So again, easing the difficulty with our data, not having to, our data across the border, which is obviously always a problem, especially with uh, getting it through ethics and privacy and consent form development as well. Actually, a friend of mine who uh, collaborated with a lot of studies was, um, she introduced me to REDCap through the University of Calgary, and they were using it for their studies, and she was showing me how easy it was to use, and we kind of had an idea that uh, the group that we often uh, collaborate with would all go together and all start using REDCap for our projects uh, and making it easier to use and being consistent through all our studies. And then uh, we ran into some issues because um, our project was run out of the University of Calgary, and unfortunately, we lost our help, and we were desperate. They had our data, but there were issues, and I couldn't access the data. So on advice and the help from our REB research director, Susan Chenick, she suggested that maybe um, Island Health, as they were the holders of the uh, red cap at that time, that maybe perhaps that they would uh, allow us to use uh, their red cap system. So we called Victor on a whim and a prayer and desperate times, called for desperate me measures, and luckily Victor and his group allowed us to uh, use their red cap system. Uh, next slide, please. So for our project, uh, five of our six sites are responsible for entering their data directly into red cap. One site couldn't commit to the data entry because they're using foreign trained orthopedic surgeons as research coordinators for this project and, and, and they were learning research experience. So just due to their work volume being both uh, surgeons learning research as well as being coordinators, they just didn't, couldn't commit the time. So I do their data entry for them. So the sites enter the data. They, uh, then they scan their CRS and send it to me, and then I verify their data entry into REDCap with what their CRFs are noted. And then um, if there's any queries, I open them up. I just enter a comment into the field that I have a query on, asking them to uh, either correct the data, it doesn't match the CRF, or it doesn't make sense, um, and, and then the sites address it. Once the sites address it and, uh, and answer the queries, they resend the CRS with the corrected information and scan them again, send it to me, and I re-verify them. And once the problem is resolved, I make a note in the comment section that it's resolved, and then I lock the form. If something comes up after the fact, I can always unlock the form at any time and uh, open up any more queries if need be. Next slide. So likes and dislikes. Personally, the best thing about REDCap has been my uh, relationship and um, communication with Victor and Nathan. They've been unbelievably helpful from the from the ground up, and uh, couldn't have done it without them. So I especially want to uh, thank the, both of them. They're exceptionally easy to work with, and extremely uh, helpful, and very quick to respond. So that's my number one like about REDCap through um, AHSN. So REDCap itself, the likes are it's relatively relatively intuitive. It's easy to learn. The CRFs can pretty well uh, replicate the CRFs that the, the sites get for data entry, so it makes um, data entry all that easier. Reports are in real time. Um, anything, anytime a data is updated or entered, it automatically updates on the reports, which is great. You never have to um, redo the, the forms. They're always updating. Changes are easy to make throughout, even if you notice a change a year or two into the project on your CRFs, uh, a quick call to Nathan or Victor and they're able to, to correct it. So that's really nice that you can always make, them, uh, make changes throughout. The ability to customize user rights are, are, are a huge plus for this and the roles within the project. So really like that. Um, ability to change, uh, change throughout the project again as I mentioned, and the, the something that I didn't put on the slide, but it's very easy to export um, the reports to the pr packages that they are using for your analysis. It's super easy to do that. So next. So we have very limited experience relating to the actual reporting capability in REDCap because we're just at that pro uh, process right now. So I don't necessarily have any dislikes. 
I can't really comment on the ability uh, of the reports, like I said. Um, the one comment I have to say is you, you want your reports to be as precise as possible and as short as possible. And trying to get empty fields out of my reports is something that I'm working on with Nathan, Nathan at this time. So that's the only one comment of a possible dislike uh, with regards to red cap at this time. Next slide. So lessons learned. Red cap is way better than paper CRFs and, it's, uh, and Excel to collect and analyze the data. Um, Ideally, and if you can, assist with the actual development and the uh, design of the project within REDCap. I highly recommend that. It gives you insight into the relationships between the data collection instruments and allows for better reporting. It's easy to get other people to help you with that, but it's really better to do it yourself. And then try to think of all the scenarios that could happen, because they do happen, and how they can be managed in the system. Try to think outside of the box and um, Think of absolutely every scenario that you can when you're developing the project and see if it's going to work. Uh, although that's hard, obviously, uh, hindsight is always 2020. So, uh, and the one thing I can comment is keep the use of text fields to a very bare minimum. Try not to use those because uh, they're hard to calculate. Next. Although it's hard to think of the conclusion of the project when in the midst of the development, knowing what you want in the end will assist in the setup. Be involved in the setup as much as you can, the development, the design. Review and test the project as much as possible in the beginning before going live. And I'm sure each project will get easier with more experience. And that's all I have to say. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Maria. Thanks a lot for this presentation. Um, sounds like a great project. Uh, can I just ask for one clarification? Do your study use data access groups? Yes, we do. Okay, so it's just something to um, add to our listeners that REDCap has this capacity for multi-site studies to um, put people in groups so that they will only see the data related to their site and not other data. So Maury as a coordinator would have access to all of the data, but each site entering their own data would only have access to their own. Yes, that's right. And it's really nice because our sites from, from Spain is, can use it as well, so that makes it easy because it is international as well. Great. Well, thanks a lot, Marie, again. And I'm sorry there's construction that just started in the next door. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry if there's some background noise here. Uh, so I'm going to move quickly to Jesse Dillon, uh, the next presenter, who is the Clinical Research Coordinator with the UBC's Department of Anesthesiology, Pharmacology, and Therapeutics. Um, and Jesse also serves as the BC Research Coordinator for the Chronic Pain Networks, uh, the UBC Fraser Health site, uh, Jean Pattison Outpatient Care. And, uh, and she will be talking about her project. So let me just move on to the next. Here you go. Hi, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> today I'm going to be talking about one of our projects, um, and it's uh, titled The Use of Advanced Neuroimaging, MEG, EEG, and MRI, uh, to investigate thalamocortical dysrhythmia in chronic pain patients with central sensitization. Um, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> and just a little introduction to chronic pain. Uh, chronic pain is defined as pain that persists for greater than three months. Uh, estimates indicate that one in five Canadians suffer from some type of chronic pain, and that a third of these Canadians report that the pain is very severe. Um, globally, an additional one in 10 people will be newly diagnosed each year. Uh, given that the Fraser Health Authority serves more than 1.8 million people, it can be extrapolated from the Canadian estimates that approximately 540,000 residents in the health, uh, Fraser Health region have some sort of chronic pain, and that 180,000 of these may have severe disabling pain. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, while the treatment of acute pain uh, is reasonably well managed, the etiology and maintenance of chronic pain symptoms over time remain a scientific and clinical challenge. Uh, currently, little is known about the neurosignaling pathways that cause some to experience chronic pain, but not others. Um, there is, however, evidence to suggest that some patients may experience amplified pain signaling through a process that's called central sensitization. And central sensitization is characterized by symptoms of widespread pain and a hypersensitivity to pain signals. 
Uh, there is also evidence to suggest that many chronic pain syndromes may be caused by a central sensitization. At this time, there's no way to objectively diagnose CS, um, and the diagnosis is based on clinical findings which are subjective in nature. So therefore, it is uh, of significant interest to the clinical community to find non-invasive ways to reveal where changes in the brain and sensitization processes might occur, and then relate this back to a patient-specific pain experience. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the neuroimaging techniques that we use in our study are EEG, MEG, and MRI. Uh, while the EEG and MEG provide the highest temporal resolution available in brain imaging, MRI will provide us the great, uh, a great spatial resolution. Uh, several studies have used EEG to measure brainwave activity in different types of chronic pain patients. And studies in neurogenic pain patients have shown that there is the resonant interaction between the thalamus and the cortex of the brain, or in short, um, a disruption in the neural circuit that links these two areas. And it's referred in the literature as a thalamocortical dysrhythmia, or TCD. Um, and TCD has been suggested as a possible cause or contributing factor for neuropathic pain and other disorders. Um, next slide. So the MEG and the EEG, uh, the MRI are housed at uh, SFU's Image Tech Lab, which is at Surrey Memorial Hospital. Um, all of our patients will be recruited from the pain management clinic, which is um, in the Jim Pattison Outpatient Center, uh, which is also part of Surrey Memorial. Um, so we'll be recruiting 30 patients from the pain clinic uh, and 30 healthy controls matched for age and gender. Um, while we have no trouble uh, recruiting our uh, pain patients, we are having a little bit of trouble um, recruiting our healthy control. So if anyone out there wants to volunteer, please let me know. Um, the primary outcome measure of this study is to evaluate differences in the EEG patterns between the pain patient group and the healthy control group, and then to examine for evidence of TCD in the pain group. So we have research assistants ready with iPads in hand at the clinic recruiting our patients. All of our data is entered onto the iPads through REDCap, um, and the MEG and the EEG will be performed simultaneously, and a T1 structural MRI will be collected after the MEG EEG scans. Um, the next slide. So why REDCap? Um, I like the idea that REDCap can be accessed from anywhere and from any device. Uh, while my office is not located at the clinic and I'm not always present at the clinic, I can still monitor the progress of recruitment and screening as the RAs are entering data live. Um, and the data collected at time of screening is age, gender, we have our inclusion, exclusion criteria, um, and we also go through a central sensitization inventory, which is just a, um, a, it's another survey which will give us a score at the end. We collect some demographics data, a medical history, uh, and a series of questionnaires. Um, next slide. Uh, so in order for them to be eligible for the study, they would have to score 40 or higher on the CSI to be in the chronic pain group. Um, they would have to score below 40 to be eligible to participate as a healthy control. Um, and all these calculations are done by REDCap, and the score is indicated immediately. So I like that REDCap takes you through step by step. Uh, it's less likely for um, you know, an RA to make an, a human error or any one of us to really make an error and enroll a patient that should not be enrolled in the study. Um, and it's much quicker than trying to get your calculator out and, and you know, trying to get a score for um, some uh, CSI. Uh, and then once the CSI score is calculated, there'll be a pop-up in REDCap to let you know whether or not they are eligible. Uh, and then it, it lets you advance to the next step, which it would be the scheduling of the exams or the scans. Um, <clears throat> and it's nice that REDCap sort of um, lets you go through step by step. So you'll, you know, when you're putting in the inclusion exclusion criteria, um, you know, if there is something that they're there, if they're not eligible, a pop-up will come up and say that they're not eligible. Um, and then it even, um, after they are eligible and everything is fine, we'll ask if, it will ask if the consent has been um, uh, signed and the time of the, the, the signing of the consent, and then you can move on to next step by step. Um, you can go on to the next 
next slide here. Um, so while so all our participants, the, we have the uh, chronic pain group and the healthy controls. Uh, the main study requirements is, is the EEG and questionnaires. So the MEG and MRI are optional parts of the study. But the way that we have it set up is that all on the same day to Jessica, reduce the burden on the patient. So we haven't had anyone who... Jesse, can you hear me? Can you still hear me? Uh, you break I can up. hear you. you. Your sound was just breaking up. We couldn't hear your last sentence. Oh, okay. Is it, is it better now? I can go through that again. Yeah, just this slide, please. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, so um, the, our main study requirements and the main study consent um, covers the EEG uh, and the questionnaires, which uh, there's some pain questionnaires, there's anxiety, depression questionnaire, quality of life. Um, but the MEG and the MRI are optional scans. Um, but the way we have it set up is that all the scans will occur on the same day. The EEG and MEG will occur at the same time, um, and the MRI will occur afterwards. But we set it all up so that, you know, the burden is less on the patient. Um, next slide. So um, the use of REDCap is uh, also very beneficial for this patient population as it can be very difficult or uncomfortable for them to be sitting in one spot for too long. Uh, they also don't know what their day is going to look like in regards to their pain levels. Um, so it's helpful in cases where there are questionnaires and surveys to be filled out. Uh, if a survey is not completed during the visit, it can be sent out to them. So they may complete it in the comfort of their own homes and they don't have to do it in one sitting. They can pause and come back to it later. Um, REDCap has also been invaluable in um, other of our studies. Uh, we have a registry study which we are collecting a lot of data and it's around tw a 10 to 12 questionnaires and we were emailed up completed and I can send out reminders to the participants uh, if they have not been completed yet. Um, and so one of the goals of the chronic pain network uh, is to have um, pilot studies such as this one to eventually become a multi-site study. And it's very convenient when REDCap is also available at the other institutions in the network. So we're all you know, collecting data on the same platform. Um, the only issue that I've really encountered is um, the loss of wireless internet. When I was filling out a survey for a participant, I ended up losing all the data that I had entered just on that one slide. Um, so I, it would be nice if REDCap had a pop-up that indicated that the connection went down um, and maybe not continue collecting data until a reconnection was established. Uh, that's the only thing I've really, um, you know, come across that I don't like, but I guess that could be an argument for Apache Internet Service rather than Red Cap. Um, and that sort of takes us into lessons learned, which is my next slide. Um, I will always make sure I'm plugged into the Internet when I'm collecting data. Um, but, you know, it would be really unlikely for me to set up a study without Red Cap. And I've been using Red Cap for so many years. Uh, it's easy to use. It's intuitive. I can um, build all the instruments required for my project myself. Um, and that's really great, especially for someone like me who has no previous experience in building databases or programming. Um, I also would like to mention that for our future projects, uh, I would like to learn um, about using REDCap to consent electronically. I think it'd be really great for our um, registry project in particular. Uh, that way they can, the participant can just, um, you know, link to, like, go to REDCap through a link or you know, one of those QR code scanner things, um, and then they can just be taken directly into the surveys and they can do them at their own pace. Um, so I think that you know, there's always new things to learn with REDCap and I, um, that's gonna be my um, next step in REDCap, e-consenting. Um, so that was it for my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks a lot for your presentation, Jesse. It was great. Um, Thank you. So this reaches the end. So just uh, just as a note, I guess, around e-consent, we, we do have at BC Children's Hospital a pilot right now looking at using REDCap for e-consent. And there's definitely lots of interest from uh, various um, people around the province. So I think this is definitely a next step that we, we will see happening quite soon. 
Yeah, that's great. Because a lot of our patients um, come from all over BC, like we have patients in Hope. So it'd be really great to, you know, um, sometimes we can catch them when they have an appointment at the clinic, but they uh, see their clinician, and then they want to leave right away. So this would be great if they could just be at home and, and, you know, consent electronically. That's great. Thank you. Thanks. So this concludes our slides. I just wanted to finish by telling you that, again, there's lots and lots of resources around REDCap and there's a few links here um, that uh, you can, with some tutorials and, and other documentation that you can access later. And right now we're open for questions. Hi everybody, and thank you guys for presenting uh, once again. So I'm going to open up the microphones and unmute everybody. Uh, so you guys are more than welcome to ask your questions using uh, that function or uh, using the chat, uh, whichever you prefer. So yeah, the floor is open now for questions. Oh, I'm unmuted, I just stopped sharing the slide. Oh, okay, yeah, perfect, yeah. Um, so if you guys want, um, please feel free to ask your questions using uh, the microphone or the chat. Well, that's okay if there's no question. Um, yeah. Do you guys have any comments as well? To, like co comments are open too. We're open to those as well uh, if anybody wants to share anything. It's always intimidating, I think, to... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so you're, on, you're on computer and you don't know who, are, who is the audience on the other side. Um, but any question, like we're always happy to, uh, to respond to any question by email as well. And our email is, what is our email? Um, redcap at bchsn.ca, I believe. Is it for our email? Let me just double check what our email is. Um, to type the email. Oh, we'll, we'll have it available mm -hmm. in the Yes, redcap at bcahsn.ca. Uh, so feel free to direct any questions there and uh, we will be happy to answer and help you in any way we can. So maybe we'll leave it for like a, a minute to see if people yep. are still percolating with questions. Um, ah, we have a question um, actually via the chat. Um, and the question is, does it do any analysis? So it depends what kind of analysis you're talking about. Um, it provided has a um, statistics and graphics module. And what that does really is give you some um, stats on each variable one at a time, uh, where it will basically, if, if your variable is a number, it will give you the average and um, variation of this number. If your um, variable is a drop-down list, it will give a pie chart of all of the different options and what percent of your respondents have picked each option. So you have that uh, summarization, if you will, at, at each variable level. For anything that's across variable, and so in, and in your report, you can look at, uh, give me all patients that uh, feed uh, that are males and over 50 and with that specific diagnosis. So as long as those are data you've collected, you can add this and then it will give you a list of those patients. So these are, these are the kind of things that REDCap can do for you. Now, if you're thinking of an analytical test and um, uh, like looking at correlations between two different variables, uh, you need to export your data and do that in SPSS or um, R or any, any other uh, statistical tool you, you, you would use. Does that answer your question? Yes, okay. Yes. Um, does anybody have any other questions to ask? Well, one thing that's great with REDCap is that um, because it's such a vibrant community, there's always new uh, functionalities that are being uh, created and built by developers all around the world. And uh, REDCap has created this framework called external modules, uh, where um, people um, in whichever institutions, they have a specific need that REDCap cannot uh, answer right now. And they have a programmer who can just 
develop a solution to fill that need and they can submit it to this repository of external modules and now it's available to the whole Red Cap community to download and use for free. Um, and so there's lots of little tools here and there that have been built for specific needs uh, that other can use. And so I know at Island Health, for instance, there's one that is in development, not available yet, but in development, um, that does look at um, cross a variable analysis, so just two variable at a time to be able to uh, draw correlations or, or things like that. So um, there are always um, there are always lots of things that can be added and customized into Redcap, and uh, and keeps changing and new features keep keep coming up. We upgrade it to so we we're following the long term um, support release, which is um, a six months um, cycle, where every six months there's a new major release with new features coming in, and uh, and we keep up to date with those upgrades. So each time there's new features, they they come along and, and every user has access to them.